you have questions. So the first thing, just so that we have a little background, is we want you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Just your name, if you grew up here, anything like that. All right, go ahead. <laughs> All right, my name is Maureen Weisblatt. I was born in New York City. Um, I went to college to become a high school social studies teacher at um, Albany State, now called SUNY at Albany. I went on, I was a social studies major. I was a library science minor. And you needed a master's degree to teach social studies in the New York City school system in 1963. So I had the library and social studies were the teachers least in demand. Albany gave us charts. Library science was most in demand. So I went to library school at Syracuse University in New York. I had just become engaged. My husband was from Syracuse. Now my husband is from Syracuse and that's where I went in library school. Graduated in 1964, January. My first professional job was at the Baldwin Public Library on Long Island where I worked full time for two years. Then I um, left, worked part time very few hours after I had my two sons and worked at the Dix Hills Public Library in Dix Hills, New York, part time, very part time. Then we moved to Freehold, New Jersey um, I became the director of a tiny, tiny little library, very little, the director and the only librarian at this little library where I stayed until 1978 when I moved, we moved to Cleveland. Um, my husband took a job here. We knew no one. We had no family. My sons were now 10 and 12. And um, I was hired um, almost immediately. The current manager, who was Janice Campana, now one of my best friends, was leaving. And um, they hired me to become branch manager of, at that time it wasn't called branch manager, it was called branch librarian, um, I think, of University Heights Public Library. So I started there August 1978. <laughs> All right, that's sort of where I came <laughs> <laughs> um, My name is Susan Black. I grew up outside Washington, D.C. My dad worked for the federal government. I went to college, undergrad in West Virginia, met my eventual husband. He was from Ohio. He was a year behind me in school, so I went to the University of Pittsburgh for my um, library science degree, but I didn't finish there, and then I moved to Ohio with him, and after maybe a year or two, I went and finished at Kent State, so I did eventually graduate from Kent State. My reference teacher there was a close personal friend of my husband's family, and the children's literature person um, was a, a wonderful teacher. And when after I graduated, they both, I thought I wanted to work in a school because summers. And, um, but I hadn't gotten a job in the school yet, yet. And they both called me and said, Cleveland Heights needs a children's library. And you really, they both called me. And both of them, I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, children's librarian? Public library, what's wrong with this picture? So um, eventually uh, I did come up and have an interview and as it turned out, the Children's Library at University Heights, my story is um, that she had been there a few years and she left and then the person they hired stayed four hours and left. I think Maureen thinks she was there a little bit longer, but anyhow, by the time I interviewed, I interviewed with Rachel Nelson, who was director, and Carol Hemmelstein, who was head of children's services, and um, not knowing that how desperate they were. And so um, at one point in the interview, they said, what do you think will be your biggest challenges here? And I started to tell them something. 
And Carol stopped me and said, what about lack of experience? Do you think that might be? I said, yeah, that's probably going to be a challenge. So they sent me over. I went over to University Heights, probably to have Maureen look at me. This was October 1978. So she'd been there two months, lost a children's librarian already, and here I am. And she says, you know. I came. <laughs> the University Heights had no staff. Um, the adult librarian had left. Um, I had a part-time adult librarian, a pre-professional, two pre-professionals, children's pre-professional in Susanna Condon, an adult um, pre-professional in Elaine Klein, and Arlene um, Rosenberg, whose son still uses the library, Victor, and I'm not sure he's not on the Friends board now, um, was basically my only li librarian, and we had some circ staff, and that was it. But you see, I had come from being the director of this small public library, and I was in my late 30s, and I knew I knew everything. So, um, but I had come from a library where I was ordering all the books, adult and children's, doing all the programs, and because it was so tiny, um, do, you know, inside and out, doing all the programs. So I had been doing the children's um, programs, and they sent over a children's librarian who um, had no control. The kids were twirling around, and I wanted them sitting. Um, so <laughs> Susan Con Suzanne Condon and I said, all right, we can do these children's programs also. But we were very happy to get a real children's <laughs> and, somebody with no experience and you know and it was a very um, unsettling time in Cleveland Heights system because um, the uh, former director whose name was Sarah Cody who was a very um, strict excellent librarian I, I mean just wonderful n known statewide had just retired Rachel Nelson had not become the director yet she was acting director Stephen Wood was still head of adult services would eventually come over to be um, the second in command so they had their problems here at, at May at Lee and they left us alone the branches were like out of sight, out of mind. Nobody's complaining. Do your own thing, and we were we were we kind of struggled along until it we worked. Said, we said we just made it up, you know. As we went along, and nobody was going to pay the attention because we were doing fine. The community loved us. That's right. That's all. <laughs> And people still meet me, because um, I meet now, I volunteer at Menorah Park, and the population at that time was very heavily um, Jewish, and um, they, they still ask about Susan. I mean, I don't think I go through a time where I volunteer that some older person doesn't ask me about Susan, and they had their kids in story time, or, you know. So it was, it was really fun, nice times. It was very staff just you know it was a very um, nurturing um, place it was it was it was great those were great years all right more than you wanted to know no that's good yeah. so you got us to 1978 <laughs> <laughs> okay so you did answer sort of our first question yeah. a little bit but um, we do want to ask you what is your best memory of working here out of the whole time you've been here, or we're here. Or memories, if they're a yes. selection of, of experiences. I would say the people. Um, the people I worked with, the people who became my friends, um, both the staff and um, people from the community. We had some wonderful, very orthodox people um, that just became really close with us. I mean, people with 13 children, um, most of whom no longer live in the Cleveland area. Um, but I would say um, the staff and, and the people. And it was, it was fun times. I mean, we used to have, and I, I didn't bring it, um, I found this 1980 open house. I'm sure it's somewhere up in, up in the archives. Um, we would have um, 
big open houses with um, this was a harp and um, the community, the mayor would come and speak. We would serve, um, we would buy refreshments because it was um, very, had to be kosher. We got it from Unger's. They made us trays. Um, we had a little man at one point who worked for executive caterer and he got executive caterer to um, give us all the food for one of our um, open houses or parties or whatever. It might have been an anniversary yeah. of some sort. And yeah. I mean, it was that kind of thing. Um, we were out in the community, out and about, um, but it was just, you know, it was just fun. Uh, Cedar Center also was a happening place in those years. All the stores, many, many of the stores that eventually moved out and to other shopping centers started in um, Cedar Center. At that time, we had two grocery stores in the area on either side of the street. Um, and it was Corky and Lenny's was there. Um, Davis Bakery, of course, was there. Um, we had Donna Lee Dress Shop, which was another very popular um, store. We had um, Burger Silver um, Jewelers, which went out eventually to Eaton. It's now closed. Um, but Cedar Center was one of the major shopping areas in the community. We also were open um, our hours, why our hours were kind of different than the other two branches were uh, uh, because of the supermarket. Thursday night, they kept us open till nine o'clock because that's when the supermarket closed. And, um, you know, we were open Saturdays, but our hours were basically strange. Um, we were similar to today, Monday, Tuesday, um, Thursday from 12.30 to 9, we were open. Um, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday from 9 to 5.30. But it, to me, it was, it was always about the people. And, yeah, I think that's what I would say. And, and serving the people. I mean, one of our busiest days was the f Friday after Thanksgiving. I mean, it was wild because everyone was home from schools, from colleges, and they had to do their research. And we were research. Now, it's Google, but we were, we were research. And books were research, and encyclopedias were research, and we had a huge reference section. And I think that's what was a lot different. Yeah, I, I would say the customers and the staff, of course, but it was they, they were really all interesting people. And why this Orthodox community embraced us, Maureen said to me, well, I was raised Catholic, she was raised Jewish, and they were Orthodox Jewish community, and she said to me one time, they're as strange to me as they are to you. I mean, it was like a, a different religion, but they embraced us, and it was all about their love of learning and reading, you know, reading appropriate things, certainly, but um, just sharing that kind of, you know, that kind of thing was, was pretty special. And, and you know, it just, it just continued. I said every day I learned something new, but you do that as a librarian anyhow. So that's sort of an overview of the love of the job. This specific job had to be the, the people I worked with in the community specifically. I commuted from, I live in Summit County, so it was a, you know, on a 40, 45 minute on a good day commute to the library, and I did that for 34 years. Right. <laughs> so something was working, you know. It was and I always lived in Orange, yeah. and people would say to me, why do you live all the way out there? And I thought, hmm, all right. It, it was just a different feeling of, of distance than, than here. Um, but also circulation. Our circulation was high, in, especially in the beginning, because we were there pre-Beachwood. So we were the last library on the horizon. I mean, Bertram Woods was there, but they were down there. And South Euclid was there, but... We were there. So we had that whole Jewish population that were coming to us, and our circulation was huge. Um, they had just brought up the children's li library um, a few years before 
and um, after opening that downstairs as a You're child. talking about the UH building? Yeah. When, yeah. The kids' room was downstairs okay. in the basement, and that's and, why the door is on the side, because you could go in there without going into the rest of the library. Right. You could just go down there, get your books, check them out down there, and leave. Um, I think it became a security issue. issue. Um, even in those in and 78. Even, and a budgetary thing because right. you had to have two sets of everything. And so they just moved everything upstairs. And, but know. we didn't have to go through that. No. That was and they moved happened. it to a different location so it didn't look like they were coming back to the same place. Right. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so we both decided it was the people. Yeah, I think so. What else? <laughs> Free books. <laughs> and the people we helped, um, yeah. because they would come back. Oh. And, and and a lot, like, I don't know, I don't remember people, even faces, but I would remember questions. <laughs> I re would remember the question <laughs> of Mrs. Greenfield, who I've seen. We were trying to remember her name, and I was going to tell you what her name was, because I remember. And she was the juicing lady, yeah. and she is still juicing. That's great. We talked, I have a few oh. pictures, and I will find more to get them out of my yeah. house. But um, Joel Pomerantz. Oh, I still see. The, this particular family, now they weren't... Um, they weren't ultra orthodox. orthodox. Right, they weren't ultra orthodox. Right. They were more uh, modern orthodox. For orthodox. Passover, you have to get all the leaven food out of your house, right? They would bring their hamster or guinea pig, guinea pig maybe, to the library for the holiday. So, the, and then would come to the library and feed him and take care of him, but he couldn't be in the house because his food was not kosher. That's the kind of service we, pro we provided. <laughs> the, um, he's, he's a probably 40 year old man with several children. Many children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they were a wonderful family. And, and talking about the, the house that's, one of the houses that's not there, where the parking lot is at UH, um, the Brown family lived there. And they, one Thanksgiving, came into the library and said, we don't have enough chairs. Can we borrow your folding chairs for our Thanksgiving dinner? I said, sure, why not? Well, no, we did check with the director. Did with I, did, yeah. I did check with Rachel Nelson and um, our custodian, Ernest Haynes, mm -hmm. who was the most lovely man, um, brought them over and went and picked them up. It was just across the Yeah, uh, it, was, it was yeah, very close. And I still see her, um, the, Mrs. the Brown. Mrs. Brown. I still see her. She, she lives across from Menorah Park, and she'll come and visit me when I go there to volunteer. She'll come and have lunch. So I mean that kind of thing, people became friends. I mean we were part my, of my their kids lives. Call them my library friends. Right. Is that the library friend mom? <laughs> because also we knew when their son in law got ill and we were part of their lives. We mm -hmm. we lived with them. And it was in my case, I think, because I had no family here except my kids. So the library and the library people became my family. <laughs> All right. So, you did mention that the neighborhoods have changed and things like that. How did it change while you were here? What were the biggest things that you saw? In the early days, we knew there were African American families in University Heights. We never saw any of them in our library. No, I mean, they just didn't come in. Um, I worked with the city and did a series of discoveries that the mayor did for years on basically she wanted to form a curricula and she wanted to see how she can integrate everyone into the fa into the community. We did programs on African American, we did programs on Muslims, we did programs on Orthodox, we did programs on gays and, and lesbians, and she had speakers, and she had people coming in, and Steve Wood, they wanted Steve Wood to do it, and Steve Wood said, Maureen, it's your community, you go. Um, so for years I, I did that, but for years we just didn't see 
any African-American people. By the time I left in 2008, I would say probably 80% was of the of our current um, borrowers were perhaps, maybe 75% were African-American. Um, so the community changed, but what happened with the Jewish community, Jewish community had two waves out of University Heights. And the first wave was kind of in 78. So when my kids started school in Orange, a lot of their friends had just moved from schools in University Heights, mainly Belvoir, or yeah, Belvoir it was called at that time, then it became Garrity, but, and then it became nothing, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it is. I'm not sure what it is now, if there's a school there. But, um, but that's what happened. And then in the 80s somewhere, there was another wave out. Um, just the whole community, and it was just Cleveland, because every 20 years, like, Cleveland moves east, and it, it's all over. I mean, they move east, they move south, they just seem to move. Now, I think, which is fortunate, we're moving back west, so we're coming back downtown. But the community just moved, and um, that's what happened with you. And basically what happened was Cleveland came into Cleveland Heights and University Heights, the inner sub, because they weren't there in, in great numbers. Mm -hmm. And I would say that's what happened. Um, the Orthodox population still is around Taylor. There's still a large population. I'm not sure, I'm sure a number of them come into the library. I don't think it was what we had, because we just had this small group of people who were not from Cleveland, that came from Canada. Um, they came from all over, and they seemed to have found us. And we just had a, a lot of ultra-Orthodox using us at that time. Well, tell them what you had to do with Story Hour. Remember when you started doing Story Hours and you were doing holidays and birthdays? Well, and I, I never really wanted to do that anyhow, but it did become a point of conversation with the youth services because, yes, diversity is wonderful and we should, you know, be open to everybody's ideas. But if a parent says to you, are you doing Christmas stories next week? It's fine, but we can't come if you're doing it. Well, then you're not promoting diversity because they don't want to hear those stories and so they're just not going to come. And that's absolutely appropriate. They don't want their children to necessarily to learn about you know the more of the world, so it it did become a point of conversation, and I just didn't do holiday story times. Although we did do, and it wasn't just it wasn't a story time for years. We had a gigantic Halloween party. Oh, it was the best! <laughs> and they would decorate you know downstairs in, in our basement. Yeah, oh my that was, god, that was nuts. It was spectacular. <laughs> Lots of good fun. But, um, but as far as you know, preschool story time every week, there weren't going to be stories about holidays. But so birthdays, I, remember Jehovah Witnesses didn't want you to right, do any birthday right. stories? Right. I mean, that's what became obvious. It wasn't just this one population saying, please don't do Christmas stories. It was, you know, we don't do Thanksgiving, we don't do birthdays, we don't do whatever. And those usually aren't great stories anyhow. <laughs> They're sort of purposefully written and so that we weren't and, missing anything. And not that we didn't have displays. Of course, we had sure. the other group that wanted those stories, right. so we had, you know, they were and there and we had to... Christmas display. collection over at University Heights, that's true. So, you know, yeah. how, you know Halloween, um, Valentine's Day, um, yeah. you know. Yeah. But, you, yeah, you, you, could, you could avoid things and not offend people and still have everybody happy. What I was going to say, what didn't change in the community is Wiley, which it has changed now, um, it was always a junior high or a middle school and you know they changed the age of the kids that went there, but they always poured out of that building into our library. So, you know, that that's one thing that went on for all 30 plus years that the kids of that age poured into And the we never had very many um, school-age children 
um, you know, for, mm -hmm. for programs. We had yeah, we lots of um, preschool, mm -hmm. nursery schools, and that was fine. But the older um, kids, that's not where our school was. They closed what was Northwood Elementary pretty early on in our um, time there. So our main school was Wiley. And Wiley was, be it was difficult because of the size of the building. When you have kids, yeah, you have forty or fifty kids <laughs> just coming into your building. Mostly for the water fountain. Yeah, mostly <laughs> for the water fountain. Um, it it changed, and we were the first probably building in Cleveland Heights that had an after school place because we were the ones that needed <laughs> somewhere. somewhere for some of these kids to go. Um, but I remember um, asking kids politely to leave. There was um, a, a gentleman who now runs one of the major um, restaurants in the area, and I remember asking him to leave a few times a week because he was just thoroughly out of control. Did as you a, hear the program this morning about brain development? Yeah. They have no brain until they're about 25, maybe. <laughs> and so, it was clear that that was true. So, you know, that kind of... Of thing. But um, when I started, when you started, we always, you know, for better or worse, always had a security guard. That was not new. Oh, oh this was the strangest thing, though. <laughs> we had this little man, oh God, and you're too young to know who he was. He was a man named Red Buttons. He was a comedian. And he had little rosy red cheeks. He with, didn't work at the library. No, He's this, referring this to him. is his nephew, I think. His, his, this man we had our security guard was about Five, two, maybe. What he was, but he was the security guard only on weekends. He was there only sa Saturday and Sunday. And made, mainly, he just counted people. Okay, I didn't know. That's what he, it wasn't he really did. Was right, fine. and eventually we really, we were at a point where we needed um, a security guard. And do we have someone before Tenable? Do we have a per, another person after Mr. Baker? Oh, yes, we had um, Judy's friend, Mr. Morton. Wasn't oh, he yeah, a yeah, security? Yeah, he was, sec was there for a long time. I he mean, came from Lee Road. He was, had already been working. Here, right. But, and, but he was with us every afternoon, and we had him for years. He became like part of our family, so when he didn't feel well or, or, or was slumping over a little, I mean, it was like we were watching him. Yeah. At the end, I mean, he was such a nice man. He was a very nice man. <laughs> um, and then we had this group, Tenable, um, who was guarding um, our building, um, and they, were they yeah, and the kids called them that, and and that's was it was terrible, it really was, and also they were very poorly trained. We used to say they got their uniform as they got on the bus to come to our building. And, you know, it was just really hard. Yeah. But, yes, so that's how it did change in years. And it changed also because a lot of the, the staff was not comfortable with the new population coming in. So it was maybe my discomfort, maybe some of the staff's discomfort with the new kids um, that were all of a sudden pouring into the to the building a little louder, a little more frisky because, you know, they had, you know, they, they, right, and they had come through Cedar Center and stopped at every candy um, place till they were sugared by the time they got to us. Um, but you know, those were, you know, also nice kids. Uh, how about, remember that class we had on Saturday, that teacher from Wiley, and we had all those kids um, coming in? For about a minute. No, they were there almost all year. Uh, yeah. yeah. It was one in school. Yeah. yeah it, wasn't, it wasn't anything extended, though. Right. Mm -hmm. And we had the school. Wiley used to send teachers through the center because they could identify the kids, so they knew who the kids were. So we had, especially the librarian. But that wasn't our complaint. That was no. the stores within Cedar Right. Center. And the community that complained to the mayor, mm -hmm. um, because 
the kids came through and kept walking. Um, so it wasn't only University Heights because the University Heights kids would go home the other way. So they didn't pour through Cedar Center. But yeah, it, it, was, it changed a lot. Well, the community changed. Um, but libraries changed also. I mean, we started, um, the circulation system was counting, stamping, counting cards. I um, mean, it was just archaic. Then we used to, um, Gaylord would take bites out of and put day two slips and um, went on to, we computerized early. Cleveland Heights computerized in the 80s. 82, Steve came and set up the computer in our library. Um, and we were the first. Cleveland Net was Cleveland only, and then it was Cleveland Heights. And he decided that we could perhaps deal with it yeah. um, the best. Of He took a look at his other branch managers, and oh my God, it was like a revolving door in the other two buildings. Um, and he, he thought we could deal with it. So And Janice Campana, who I replaced, eventually came back to do the computer um, reconfiguration. She was in charge of the, as a contract person, she was in charge of the computer project to get us all computerized. Because you had to inventory everything and tag everything and tag it again when they changed the tags. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, but I do say that if I hadn't worked in the library, I would, I could see, I mean, it's hard to believe now, but I can see myself not being very interested in the computer because who needs it, you know? But if in 1982 you really had to know it, it be it was really. And for some of us, more challenging us. than others. I mean, she was she grew up with it because her kids were there. My kids were almost in college, so I ha I mean, I would take that mouse and fall off the desk and onto the floor. And what they didn't make us do, I think, and they probably should have made us do, was go to classes um, in service. Require us to. It was kind of on the job yeah, learning. It was very much on the job. And um, some of us learned better than others. Some of us was happy, was lucky to have somebody like Susan there, <laughs> who, who would who would do a lot of our stuff that we had to put on that computer. We had a for the kids. I have no idea how this worked because I also had an assistant who understood it. But we had a computer with a cassette tape that ran. You know, it was a Radio Shack kind of thing that ran a program on the computer, and they could do programming. I have no idea how the cassette tape was making the computer work, but she understood that they could do programming and, you know, build games and kind of, and that must have been in the early 80s too, I don't remember, but <laughs> it, was, it was the dark ages for sure. And as people left, we kept in touch, so I know the person she's talking about, I still speak to her. I mean, so truly, they became part of part of our family. I mean, part of our, you know. And she went off eventually to Stowe, where she um, re retired from. But she just had an early interest, so they put her on the computer committee, um, system-wide. She was on the computer committee. So, but yeah. Like I said, we learn something new every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so how did the technology affect your reference? Like how people came in and asked you questions? I think the biggest problem was people's expectation was great. So what happened was, especially in the early days when we were learning, they just knew we had this computer and they would come in and they wouldn't take no for an answer or I can't find it or I don't know where the, it is. They would say to us, it's in that machine somewhere, you find it. <laughs> Sure they still they still that. That. So. We, and we had along the way some very good pre-professionals who were excellent searches. I think Elise mm -hmm. was extremely good. Um, I'm just thinking who else was um, a really good searcher. That, and yes, that's all true. But also, the, I think the research we were doing was not... Like we said, we didn't have a lot of school-aged kids, so we, I mean, the encyclopedia and things like that still were working for them. A biography or a book was still working for them. It was the whacked-out questions that you still get, you know, sometimes. 
or people trying to you know, find things. And that's, that's a certainly more recent, but um, as far as deep research, we didn't, there were a few times, but you know, you sort of, they're, they're notable because they weren't. And we had to send them on. I mean, our collection was small, so we sent them over here. And, and we had John Carroll. John Carroll would let you go into their um, collection if you lived in, in University Heights and used their books. So, you know, yeah. so that's yeah, um, what happened. Um, Jezu, we had um, Jezu. We saw a lot of their kids and parents. Um, usually the kids... Jesu kids would come with their parents. Um, so they, you know, biographies they would get. And if we didn't have it, we would borrow it from Lee and bring it over. Um, if we knew we had schools come to us, if we knew they were coming, we would get a collection or reserve the books and bring them over. Um, because we were, we were small. And that was a real benefit. I leaned on that my whole career, being at University Heights, knowing... I don't have to have it all. First of all, there's Lee Road, and then there's CPL. You know, so you really you can you can have the collection you like and know that everything else is available. So that was pretty pretty good backup. <laughs> okay. So how have our services changed, or have they changed since you started to now? Libraries truly became a community gathering place, um, from being libraries to being much more welcoming, you know, um, parties. Um, the renting of your rooms. Um, That's new. I mean, we had, um, we were big at the end on uh, Parties, um, showers, um, birthday parties for children. You did a few birthday parties where the one woman. Was oh, this was funny. Remember that her one. Friends were taking her to all these important places in her life, and they. I would not perform at a birthday party usually, but they asked if they could bring her to the library because she'd come to my story time, and would I do story time? And these were. You know, how old 20, was she? Twenty-five or thirty. How old? Yeah. How old was she? About then, forty-five. Four, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, she was an adult. Yeah, yeah. She, yeah, yeah. She was an adult, but this had been something that she and I may not have been the one that did story time for, but at that. For that part of her progressive birthday party, I was so, and th so that's kind of it. I I feel like we uh, we never hardly ever said no. So uh, the services are are maybe more codified now, or you know, um, but it was always, and I think that's what Clayton Knights prided themselves on on service. You know, so it was always whatever the customer wants, we will really try hard. <laughs> And I think you still do, of course. But but it is it, probably the biggest change. I mean, certainly the computer and the classes, and, and that has just evolved because that's what you have and that's what people need. But um, in terms of you know just outright difference, we never rented our rooms for stuff. We would have programs. Well, partly it was because we were using the rooms so right. for our programs, and then you do less programming. Oh, but, but what we did have... Um, when we were not open in the morning, we had a um, GED right, and an true. ESL they, they class yeah, in the, the meeting room. Years. And so they would come in through the back. Um, by that time, we were able to lock off the library, and they would come in through the back and leave through the back. And we had, um, yeah, and we had a very active. Um, GED um, ESL, ESL program on different days with teachers um, from the Cleveland High School system. Now almost every library offers some of that. I mean, the county has them all over the place, but um, at that time, Cleveland Heights had one of the few, and they came from all over the city um, to those GED. So even though we weren't using it um, in the in two three two mornings a week, three, three mornings a week, um, we had classes there. Oh, we also had Fair, Fairmont Dance or Fairmont Center had um, a program at Coventry. Um, before the library, the library had sold Fair, um, the building to Fairmont Center, and then they were having trouble, so they sold it 
back to the library. The library took it over. So they had this dance studio that they didn't know what to do with. So um, in the morning, or, and all through the day, that's when we also used the custodian, um, they put in our, what we used to call meeting room B, a dance floor, bars all around the perimeter of mirrors. the room, mirrors, and I'm not we... sure how that happened. I mean, I sort of know how it happened. I know how it happened, yeah. but we were running a dance studio <laughs> out of the thing. Um, the director was the sister of the person who, yeah. So, I mean, they were just accommodating the community. It, it didn't last that long, maybe two years. Um, but yeah, we had that too. So, I mean, obviously we were easygoing enough that um, they put, um, you know, we got, you know, a lot the, of stuff. The, um, and, and probably that sort of instigated the renting out of the meeting rooms eventually because we weren't doing those kind of things. When we started, the JCC would have a senior citizen oh, yes. program at our library every Monday. We got a hundred people. Would, yeah. A hundred seniors would come in um, and buy and pay for like a bagel, lox, or whatever, just a cup of coffee, and and do a program. And we had a hundred, and they did the they called it extension programs, and they did them throughout the community. Um, we had a big one from the JCC, but they did one at Shaker Square. Um, they did one throughout the community. They had these, and these were mainly um, elderly people younger than I am now, um, probably <laughs> in their 60s, but they were mainly European um, and um, Holocaust, and so they looked older, they appeared older. And what happened with the program, eventually the 65-year-olds were now playing tennis, and, um, you know, and then they had the 80-year-olds. Well, it didn't mesh. Eventually, they had to close all their... Pro I mean, their, pro their d attendances dwindled to nothing. But in the early days, huge attendance. So it was, the library was always a community center, really. And that has changed a bit, but it's, it was always providing that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Did you do outreach while you were there, or was it just yeah. having people come um, in? Not as much as you do now. I have somewhere on, um, what do you call it, public TV, but it's what it, limited access, you know, like Wayne's World kind of TV. There's, there was a woman who was in our community who thought all the little girls, all the little latchkey girls at home should have a brownie troupe when they come home that they could join, and that brownie troupe should be on TV. And so she was on this access, limited access TV, and once a month I would go do story time for the brownies, that she actually had some of the girls there, but it was, you know, all of those girls on TV land, I'm sure it was thousands of them. And <laughs> so the last one of those I ever did was, I believe, on June 1st, 1982, because my son was born on June 5th, 1982. So that's the tape I want to find and destroy. <laughs> but so it was that kind of thing. We did do um, for summer reading, we certainly went to all the schools and told the kids to come. We've all we always did that. And what we had at University Heights, and I don't know I know they did it in the Cleveland Heights buildings, but I'm not sure of the timeline or anything. When I started, we were already doing stories in the park at Purvis Park. The librarians before me had done that. So all summer um, every Wednesday afternoon at 2, I was at the park doing stories there, right from the very beginning, that kind of outreach. We did do school visits, but I'm, I don't have a... It's, our, like we said, our closest elementary schools were closed pretty quickly, and so um, Wiley wasn't asking the librarian to come in and do story time. And so my school responsibilities were probably JSU, and eventually the Orthodox or Jewish schools let us come in, but that wasn't always, a, a, you know, true. And so it's it's different now. It certainly wasn't as organized as it is now, and 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 like you noticed, people were coming to us, so there was probably less need for it. But um, the the story times at Purvis Park, 
and I don't remember how many years ago, but this was a long time ago, they, when they redid the parking lot and redid some stuff over there, they put up, and it's not there now because they've since redone it, but they put up a permanent um, you know, traffic sign that said, every Wednesday in July and August, the librarian will be here at 2 o'clock. I mean, it was metal. It was like the no parking sign, you know, but the librarian will be here too on Wednesdays in the summertime. So that's how much they <laughs> wanted us to keep doing it. But that was, I mean, in 78 when it came, that was just part of it. That's what we did. So yeah. I don't know how many, you were doing probably some outreach. Book I was talk book talk yeah. um, to different organizations. Um, I would do one or two book talks for the senior group that we had in our building, and then I would just change it around and go out <laughs> into different um, ones because it's a tremendous amount of prep time if you've done those. And, um, you know, I just didn't have the time, and, you know, so, but yeah, that's basically what. And again, I was on a lot of committees um, that they, threw me out into um, the community, um, yeah. be it John Carroll or um, the city itself. We were we worked closely. I mean, we knew the mayor. We knew a lot of the police. We knew, we knew the city of University Heights. And we had a, v a very interesting gentleman who, who is not there anymore now, Walter Stenson, who um, did a lot of the outreach for this, this, the city of University Heights. And he would have. He eventually brought in the program that still they're still doing today at University Heights um, for the older seniors. Because our, our just one more thing. Our, a large part of our population was older. So we had um, probably of, of all the buildings, because we didn't have an elementary school, we had a large elderly population. And we had um, condos on the South Euclid side um, that had were mainly at that time older. Um, now it's very diverse, but at that time it wasn't. It was mainly older people. And they may have just been apartments then more, rather than condos mm -hmm. too. Because um, it's strange, a few blocks up on University Side, it's the middle of the street right. um, that becomes the difference South between Euclid. South Euclid. Because we had one Christmas Eve, we had a gentleman um, who kind of wandered in, and he came up from a mental health facility um, down below the hill, and uh, it, we were closing. We didn't know what to do, so we called the city, and the police came over, and they kind of walked him across the street <laughs> to the bus line, oh. gave him money, and sent him back down um, towards that way. But um, when the you know the police came, or if there was an accident, you had to look to see Did where the line the was. Which side of the street is it on? Just yeah, so it was it was an interesting you know community, but they were in South Euclid, but of course they were Cleveland Heights University High Schools, which made it more complicated. <laughs> okay, so the buildings have changed a lot in terms of renovation. Coventry was sold and bought back again. What what did you see when you were here with any of those? We went through two remodelings at University Heights and we while we were there. Understand why Aurora's leaving? Right? Yeah, we <laughs> um, we went through two, and we said that was it, no more. Um, uh, the first one was just slap paint, um, carpet, you know, some carpet, um, nothing really. The second one, uh, we were the last of the um, three branches remodeled, um, and and that was a biggie, but nowhere near what they are planning to do now, um, because we we didn't have the money. I mean, they didn't give us the money to do it. And if you've not had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Wood, he's a wonderful man, but he would not close a library for anything. So we worked through it. You know, we put up visine or whatever you call that plastic stuff around, you know, and we were there, and we probably shouldn't have been there a lot of the time, but we worked through it. So it was, it was a little traumatic. 
Yeah, because at, po at points, our restrooms were downstairs, yeah. and at points, we had no restrooms in the building. Yeah. No place to eat. Remember eating in our cars or going to Purvis Park or going to the rest, you know, or coming over here it's or, lovely. yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, it the, was. This is totally unrelated, except Steve reminded me. There were, I don't know what year we stopped, but there were many years we worked here before they closed on Easter Sunday. Mm -hmm. The library was always open on Easter. This built, just this building, the branches were. The year that the Passover and Easter were the same day, that's when he had a little trouble staffing. <laughs> and so now the library is closed on Easter. His, his reasoning is not, un, um, is fine. He, it was not a national holiday. It's a religious holiday. But, um, you know... Come on. <laughs> but if we want to get picky, oh, yeah. um, I, I being Jewish, mm -hmm. um, we of course are not closed, Rosh Hashanah or no. Yom Kippur. No. So I had to take sick time. That's right. Um, or, or holiday or, time or vacation time for yeah. the Jewish holidays. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember sitting at, um, because in the beginning we didn't go, the branch didn't go to um, the planning meetings. Um, eventually, they sent one branch person, and we rotated around. But then they realized, you know, we really perhaps should all have been there, so we did. And um, it was, you know, it was really mm -hmm. um, different. A, a, a bit of a challenge. Then when the board decided to close on Christmas Eve, it was... Oh, I, had, I didn't know what Christmas Eve was. <laughs> she kept saying, Christmas Eve, but it's... It goes all day. <laughs> right. That is your good question, Maureen. <laughs> so, I mean, oh, and, and we were really funny. When we closed on Martin Luther King Day, we had this sign on our front door, closed for MLK Day. And our um, residents wanted to know why we were closed for Milk Day. They were, yeah. Um, <laughs> when we put in CDs. Yeah. You know, CDs to them were certificates of deposit that you got at the bank. They weren't anything because, as they say, we had basically, you know, our, the bulk of our population was elderly. So, yeah. We had lovely people, though. I mean, just, just carry, I mean, characters. We, characters. Oh, God. Because we were the only building on a bus line. That's, that's true. I mean, on that major street. And that brought in a different element. And I, because I remember doing a, the branch managers had to go to a board meeting once a year and do a, whatever the theme was on your library. And I realized that we were the University Heights um, Public Library, but Coventry was the Coventry Village Library. And Noble was the Noble Neighborhood Library. And we were the ones on this busy street. And um, we just saw a different type of, a, a different um, people. Because we were in a neighborhood. To walk to the library, I mean, driving in Cedar Center probably today still is not a picnic. Um, and so uh, a lot of people from University Heights at the East End would just take, um, come right here to Lee. It was easier to come this way than to come up to Cedar Center. So, yeah. Not sure we're helping you with your history at all, but thank you for it. <laughs> That's not an oral history. <laughs> That's though. true. That's it's true. Just, it's the impressions and the memories that are the, yeah. the important part. Yeah. Yeah. Renovating the building twice was very Stop. memorable. What happened yeah. the second time? Um, they did much more. We put in those two um, desks, which I'm sure they're going to pull out this time. But what that was all new. What we had were old teacher desks. We had three of them. I mean, it was really pretty gross. When when we started, it was linoleum and beige walls. It was. I said, all you. I always said, you just need a breast. Yeah, look like a basketball. Either end, and it and it was a great room for that. It was. It opened in February 52, which probably tells you everything you need to know about its architecture. But 
yeah, the, the last renovation was, well, the whole basement, what had been um, just a square meeting room down there where the children's room had been, they ended up sort of tearing that out and, and carving out a room. So you have a hallway back to the, the uh, elevator and that kind of thing. So that was, so that, and putting in the elevator, we'd always had a book drop, uh, or a dummy, book dummy. Well, dumb a waiter, dumb waiter. Dumb waiter there. And when they, when they first, so they're on their second, iteration of a wheelchair lift of a wheelchair lift but when they put in the first one the guy came with his jackhammer and he's just going to make it the whole bigger right well this was built to be a bomb shelter i mean it took weeks you should have seen the for him concrete to, to, he could not believe that he couldn't just make this hole a little bit bigger so that was the beginning of <laughs> the understanding that it was not going to be easy to renovate this building <laughs> yeah, it was it was challenging, and we had asbestos. I yeah, mean, we had yeah, a lot of asbestos yeah. in the <laughs> in 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 the ceilings, um, and they had to take out this bright yellow dance studio and the mirrors and the bars and the. Um, yeah. Um, so, but we had, I still think, U University Heights Library has a very good site center. You, the people at the CERC desk can see that part of the library. The people at the reference desk can see this library. So we had no nooks and crannies. Whereas Noble, whoever's working at Noble, <laughs> and it's great, it's great <laughs> now. Um, you should have seen what it looked like when it was all chopped up in these little rooms and circulation was in the lobby and they couldn't talk to the people in the children's room and the children's couldn't talk to the people in the adult side. Um, it was... Lots of places to hide. Yeah. It, it, and it where is... Coventry with the two... Right, you know, right. Hidden corners, sort of. Yeah, where we had a great sight pattern at University Heights. Um, but going through to... And just replacing the books. Yeah. And if you count your shells, it never counts right. And you always end up with too much. And how do you get rid of all these books? And where do you put all these books? Yeah, and, yeah. And, of course, you want to save all your favorites. By the time we left, we had bought every book in that building. We, mm -hmm. we had selected every book in that building. So you don't want to get rid of these. are great. You, yeah. ha you have to realize we were there together for 30 years. No one in this library system has been 30 years. And, you know, I probably should have gone way before that because you need, you need fresh bl blood, you need people looking at the, your situation and seeing it through fresh eyes. It's oh, we were doing such a good job. And they loved us. <laughs> That's right. When um, Maureen left, it was eight, so in... Nine, yeah, um, and I did not get her job. The deputy director came over and talked to Aurora and said, "We need. We're short at Lee. We need somebody over to Lee." And she, it really wasn't a question. She was going to take me to go to Lee Road. So that's so. The last part of my career was over at Lee Road, and I forget why I started with that. Oh, talking about fresh blood and everything. So that. Yeah, you know, I didn't want to do it, but that was really good for me to come over here and see and get to know these people over here better and to see these people. And then Constance was the head of children, and she left to go do Noble, and Nancy asked me if I would be head of children's, and I said, Nancy? For 32 years, I've avoided that job. There were many times I could have applied for that job. I don't want that job, and she sort of cried. The, the backstory of Nancy is I hired her as my assistant. Before she went to library school. Before she went to library school. Joey was a year old, I think. And um, so we had an understanding that I would do anything she asked. So I said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll come be head of children's. But then when, you know, so we did, there was a reorganization. We were sort of, that's then when the, Children's and Tea became youth services, and so there was kind of that reshuffling kind of thing, and that's when I knew, I said, okay, I'll get out of the way. That, I mean, this is what, this is appropriate. I, it's time for me to leave. Here's your new library position. Have fun. <laughs> we, we were very good with our hires. We had oh, yes. exceptional people. We had a woman. We're bragging now here. 
<laughs> yeah, we had a woman that was unbelievable. Her name was Susan Matisoff. And um, we hired her. She, was, she had worked for Shaker. Her kids were really young. And they were moving. Her husband had got a job. He, he taught for Case. He got a job working for gas and oil out and whatever. Oklahoma City, they were going to Oklahoma City. They got there. To, to the university, though. All right. They got there, and the job was gone all of a sudden. So he came back, and he, he eventually got a, a job um, at Cleveland State. He eventually be, went back to Case. But she was available, and we hired her. Go on, well, tell I, about I, Susan. Well, well, let me back up a little bit. Back in the day, it's not that we hired our friends necessarily, but we had <laughs> a wonderful librarian who was leaving, and she said, but you know who you want to hire to replace me? And so we got a recommendation from her, and we ended up hiring that woman. So we did that with Sally. Uh, and I'm still so friendly with Sally. <laughs> Sally went off to um, Atlantic City, where she worked in a library. She then went to Las Vegas, and um, she um, was head of a library for many, many years, um, probably 26 years. She built this library. She worked as branch manager there along with Felton Thomas, who's the current head of Cleveland Public Library. All right? So, um, so when Sally left, she said, and that was 1982, and the reason I know that is because my son was born in 1982, and she gave me her baby changing table and some other <laughs> stuff. So she left in 82, but she said, you really want to talk to Becky Wills. She'll be great. So we talked to Becky Wills, and we hired Becky Wills, who ended up leaving us and going to work for county and became branch manager at Bay Village and went on to be, have a wonderful career. So when she left, she said, I have this friend, Susan Manisoff. You really ought to talk to her. So we did. And I, I, I don't really have any memory of early talking to Susan, but she did not make a good first impression usually, so I'm pretty sure we thought, okay, Becky, if you say so. And then she was amazing and awesome. And she was, she, you know, what was just a force to be reckoned with, and she ended up being deputy director here. So, um, so that, And I ended up reporting to her. Reporting to her, that's right. Like, I ended up reporting to Nancy. My other, I had wonderful assistants. Another assistant of mine was Laura Solomon. Uh -huh. You may know the name at OCLC, and she does, you know, what does that mean to me, Laura? And she, she was one of the early adopters of computers, so she, we were, we were greatly um, enhanced by her work with us, and and then, at, you know, others that were really, really wonderful, but just didn't go on to conquer the library world necessarily. Like like those two, but it was just really amazing. Um, Susan Matisoff went on to write a lot of, she went on to run Staff Association and write a lot of the policy um, on um, vacation, sick leave. Before um, she became a manager. Yeah, I mean, she was just amazing and died much, much, much too young um, of a stroke. Um, suddenly. Um, but yeah, we were very fortunate in the people. She was working like as the adult librarian at University Heights and saw that children's, really, we had not a great director of children's, manager of children's, and she saw it, we needed some help. And so she just sort of took over and, you know, we just sort of did what Susan said and, it, and had these. I mean, it was insane, but huge programs, and, and this was probably at the height when we had the most Orthodox children coming right. in. Right. We had Kane Park when we were out. Kane, we were at Kane Park. Absolutely. Did you ever hear about that <laughs> that summer program at Kane Park that we did? It was an end of summer celebration, <sighs> and we just took over and had a lot of entertainment and children's crafts. Uh, under the refreshments, refreshments, which had to been kosher. They had to be kosher, and it was all free, and I'm sure Susan subsidized it more than we'll ever know. But, um, you know, she, she just was a force and had great ideas and always was going to make us better than we were, and she did. Yeah, it was, <laughs> a, it was an amazing was program, so as exciting. was the library walk. Um, right. um, and, and that was um, basically Judith Sopel, who was the... Um, PR public relations person is still in the area, and um, 
they walked from Lee to University Heights and back <laughs> um, and had prizes. I mean, just for publicity, yeah. just for, you know, health. Just, um, you know, yeah, they did yeah. health things. Yeah. I mean, and the community, we had lots of people. It yeah. was, yeah. they stopped it when it became smaller. Um, but in the heyday, huge amounts of people would walk. Probably the biggest cane park this summer was twelve to 1,500 people would mm-hmm. come to that program. So that was crazy. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it was really, we had amazing, amazing programs. So, and they were community programs, and that's how, yeah. you know, we were a very integral part of, of Cleveland Heights University Heights community. Mm-hmm. They still are. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we are out of questions. All right. Really. But I wanted to give you the opportunity to add anything else that you wanted to add about your experience, about the library, the community, yourselves. <laughs> I loved it. I had 30 absolutely fantastic years um, here. Um, I never was stressed. I never came in and thought I hated to go to work. Um, I never, and I think part of it was that we were not among the big, um, your big building here. We were away. We were like off site and off site out of mind. And and they did not bother, as we say, if if nobody complained about us, and we very rarely had anybody complain, they loved us, um, they left us alone, and they let us do, because in those days, you were buying all the collection of children. Eventually, each children's person bought the collection for her, selected the collection for her, and I can say her because there were no men, I don't believe, for her building, and then when that seemed like a really stupid thing to do, although fun. Um, they said, okay, just two of you are going to buy the collection for the whole system, and I continued to hold on to that for dear life. So, which, is, which I did for the adult. Yeah, I, I bought the entire um, a, a, adult collection. We right. had McNaughton. Um, collection. This was that lease collection that libraries had. They had these little green labels on these books. I don't know if Shaker has it anymore, but they were the last one, and they had a huge collection. Instead of buying, like you do now, 100 or copy, 50 copies of your Daniel Steele, you could lease 50 copies. And theoretically, return what you return wanted them. when. And, and it, I'm not sure it ever saved you money. I think what no, it saved I don't you think is the heartbreak of having to discard all those Right. Copies. Yeah, I don't think it ever saved your money. But where I started, um, I had come from um, the East Coast. And the East Coast was kind of a little ahead of Cleveland, was a lot more conservative. So um, I was used to buying um, more racy. And we had these selection policies written down where it said no, no Jacqueline Collins, no um, Robbins, um, no, there were a lot of these authors that we censored. Um, you could not buy. You could, you could not buy. Them. We didn't select them. We didn't have them part of our collection, but they didn't tell me I couldn't lease them. And I leased, <laughs> and I leased my collection. Do you remember the people would come in, and somebody would say, "Oh my God, this was a good one. This was a real hot one." And the person behind them said, oh, "Can I have that one?" Yeah. So sooner or later, throughout Cleveland Heights, yeah. they were asking they were for our books. Yeah. So they stopped the selection policy. Greatly changed. But this was again the early '60s. We had a clipboard. At the, de- at the circulation desk, and it was just a paper. And that was our reserve list. So you would write down the name of the book and the name of the person, and you had to remember as the books came in what might be on that reserve list. Now, certainly, it's not what it is today, and it was only for our building, you know, but. And you also were paying at one point 25 cents to reserve mm-hmm. a book. Yeah, yeah. And I remember I was with my one of my sons. And, and we both have boys. I always said that if I work with anybody, whoever I worked with had boys only. And, um, and so I remember being with one of my sons and walking through Beachwood Place and this lady, Blossom, came to me and she says, here's my 50 cents. Reserve me this one and this one. <laughs> 
And I remember my son rolling his eyes and saying, Mom, don't you know any younger people? She <laughs> <laughs> tried to look younger. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I mean, it was that kind of, those were the kind of days that we were operating in. It was just different, you know, different times. Um, you would, you would, you would, people would know, well, people still, I remember where I came from, my little library, a little book came in, I know someone, someone mm -hmm. would like it. I used to call them up and, and say, this book, you know, came in, and I think you'll like it, you know, mm -hmm. you know, come and get it. But it was just smaller, um, you know, or, you know. Not friendlier, but we just didn't see people. I don't know if people moved around like they do today from, like I go, I come here and I just returned a book, but I got an orange, I got a chagrin, I got a beachwood, I got a Mayfield. I don't know if people circle around or as I used to say, there are library users and non-library users. I had them in my family. My father never went into a library, and I said, how could you be proud of that? But, um, you know, there is a small group of people who really use libraries. And a, yeah, and a lot of people who never use a library because they don't want to return the books. They read, you know, two weeks, I have to pay fines. Um, you know, they just don't. So... Well, we'll think of everything to tell you after we leave, so we'll make notes so you can have a follow-up. And if, and if you read these lovely tapes, um, if you have any follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, yeah. and please get rid of the stuff we probably shouldn't have said. <laughs> <laughs> no, Steve knows everything. He knows how I feel. He was, he was a, a great boss to work for as long as he knew the question that you were going to hit him with beforehand. If you blindsided him, forget it. But also, he trusted us. If he didn't trust you, you might not, he might not have been a great boss. But he, did, he just believed we were fine, and we continued to be And fine. again, I'm still friends. I meet for lunch the former director, Rachel Nelson who really has the history of this library yeah, system. I mean, she's yeah. your history. And her memory is wonderful, and, and she is absolutely wonderful. Um, and that's where it, you know, any questions, that's where it all is. It's, it's <laughs> certainly with Rachel. Yeah, I would say. At least that early part there. She could tell you about Sarah Cody. <laughs> <laughs> Ever hear of Wild Bill Cody? This lady was related to him. It's the, you know, no. yeah, from the Old West. Yep, yes. Yeah, but she was an uh, interesting lady. Never met her. Oh. I came to us. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. It was fun. Yeah. yeah. I do have pictures of my, one of my first storytelling groups. It was before you had to get the permission from their parents to take their pictures.